Hello and welcome to another video. This one we're going to be talking about the GIL in Python, the Global Interpreter Lock. Um, but before we do that, we have to talk a little bit about what threads and processes are and why the Global Interpreter Lock matters and why it may be interesting uh, that there's a potential project to remove the Global Interpreter Lock and what that may have in store for us as Python developers. Uh, but anyway, let's jump into it. Okay, so unfortunately threads and processes are a really complicated topic, so I'm going to try and simplify them down, uh, well maybe oversimplify them a bit, to explain how they can be used to write concurrent uh, software. And so for that we're going to use a little paint diagram, and we're going to start with just kind of like a normal single threaded piece of code, just to uh, you know, say say your hello world program, you start main, it runs at, prints hello world, and exits. Um, so we're going to kind of represent that as a single box, and we're going to represent our threads as a, I don't know, a green line here. So in, in that piece of code, there is one address space, that's what this black box is representing. The address space is like, you can think of it as the memory of the program, where you'll write variables, where the state of the interpreter lives, all that other stuff. Um, and so when you have a single threaded program, you're going to have one address space and you're going to have a single thread that runs through that. Um, if you switch to a multi-threading mode, you will have, so I guess we should write that this is like single threaded. <laughs> and most code in Python currently is single threaded. Uh, and part of that is because of the global interpreter lock, but we'll, you know, get to that, <laughs> get to that in a bit. Um, next, we'll talk about multi-threaded code. Um, multi-threaded and again this is still a single address space so any global variables can be accessed by both of the threads or any number of the threads uh, but you'll have you know any number of, of execution threads that could run code at the same time uh, now if there's any you know sections of your code that are protected by uh, you know mutexes or other sort of locks uh, you will most likely see a situation where not all of the threads will execute at the same time. So you'll you'll often see a situation where only a single thread can be running at once, um, such as you know, like like this or whatever. Um, this would maybe represent a critical section where this thread acquired the lock. Same same up here. Um, and in Python. Uh, typically what you'll see is you'll only ever see one thread executing at once because of the global interpreter lock. And what the global interpreter lock does is it means that only one thread can be executing pure Python code at once. And by pure Python, I mean like you know, dot .py files, sort of code you would see uh, directly, directly typed. Now, there are places where multiple threads can run at the same time, and that's usually in C libraries or if they're doing I.O., things like you know, reading from the network or writing to a file, uh, those are situations where the GIL will be dropped. Basically, that, that lock will be dropped and it'll allow multiple threads to run at the same time. Okay, so now that we've talked about multi-threaded, let's talk about multi-processing, which we will cover briefly in this. Uh, and it's kind of unrelated to the global interpreter lock because the lock, you know, the lock only lives inside of a particular process. Um, You'll only have one interpreter lock, so if you have multiple processes, you will have, of course, multiple locks, and those can run concurrently. Um, but if we talk about a multi-process situation, you will have many address spaces. Represent those as blocks. Actually, let's maybe not overlap them. That's going to make it <laughs> harder to see here. Uh, we're going to make them skinnier, even though in reality they would be the same sort of width there. Um, and so this is like the multi-process realm. And in this one, we're going to have you know, an on, only a single thread run for each of the processes, and uh, but they, they will be able to run all at the same time. Now, note that they don't really share any of their uh, you know any of their state. They have separate address spaces, so any global variables are you know not copied across each of them. There are ways to share memory and multiprocessing, but we won't cover that in this video. Um, but you can imagine they would have three separate processes all running code at the same time. And uh, there isn't this sort of exclusion that you would see here because they're all running concurrently. Now, again, there are ways to <laughs> do exclusion even in multiprocessing, um, but we won't, we won't cover that in this video. So that's kind of the, the, the TLDR explanation of these three 
uh, these three execution models. Uh, and again, most code in Python is currently single-threaded or multi-processed because uh, multi-threaded has you know, the limitation of this global interpreter lock. Um, but now that we've kind of shown a little bit of the theory behind this, I'm gonna show you some sort of practical examples that show exactly what I'm talking about and um, go into a little bit more details. Okay, so let's jump into actual code here. And for the code today, we're gonna to be using the concurrent futures module. This is just a very convenient uh, library that's part of the standard library that makes it really easy to write some amount of concurrent code, either using threads or using processes. And we will open up our t.py. We're gonna import concurrent.futures. We're also gonna be using time uh, and yeah, because we're gonna be timing stuff at some point as well. So we'll write ourselves a main function and run if name equals main. Just kind of get this out of the way. We're gonna have a little piece of work that we're gonna be doing. So do work and we'll just have it return an integer. Um, and I don't know, this work, <laughs> this work isn't really important. So we're just gonna do some, I don't know, addition. And let's do 10 million executions. I think that was what I used in my test, yeah. We're, we're just gonna add a number over and over. This is what I'm representing as a piece of pure Python work. So this is gonna happen entirely, it's gonna be entirely CPU bound. And so we're gonna be able to demonstrate our execution here. Uh, and in here, we're gonna do with concurrent.futures.threadpool executor. This is going to be running threads. Uh, we'll use four threads for no good reason. Uh, I actually have, uh, let's see, grep, bogo mips, proc, CPU info. Yeah, so I, I, my virtual machine has five processors assigned to it. So we're gonna use, we're gonna use a number smaller than that just so I don't have to deal with uh, any sort of contention there. And we're gonna make some futures to submit a job to this pool, you use this pool.submit function. Uh, there's also a pool.map if you wanna use that interface as well. And we're gonna submit our do work. And let's run, I don't know, 20 of these. Uh, concurrent futures also has this helpful uh, concurrent.futures.asCompleted and you pass in a list of futures for a future in this. Um, and to get the value out of the future, you call the result method on it. So we'll do print dot future dot result. And let's actually just do 1 million of these first, just to show you how this executes. Um, you'll see that it you know, runs these and it's running those in threads. And if we put it up at 10 million, uh, I wanna add some timing here just so we can see what's going on. So you can kind of see that they are running uh, in in parallel, um, but they are running kind of slowly. So if we do import context lib, uh, we're gonna make a little context manager. It just prints out our time. Uh, time, what stir returns a generator of none, none, none. Uh, t0 equals time dot monotonic. And I talked about monotonic time. I will link another video in the description about that if I remember to do that. <laughs> uh, instead of using time dot time and print uh, what took time dot monotonic minus t0, just so we can kind of see how much time it took. And I'm going to wrap these. Uh, oops, we can't call this time. Uh, time it. <laughs> And again, this is not a very scientific uh, timer, but um, it'll give us some ballpark stuff of what's executing here. Okay, so now if we run this, uh, I put it back to 10 million, so it's kind of slow. <laughs> Let's put it at 1 million. Oh, actually, this is fine enough. Uh, so you can see here that you know each individual work item is taking you know three to four and a half seconds. Um, interestingly enough, it kind of bounces around between three to four and a half. Um, and you can see it kind of returns them in chunks and that's because they roughly start them in chunks. And overall, we're taking about 21 seconds here. Um, now, if we put this at one thread, 
Now note, the, note that the work items took like anywhere between three and four and a half seconds. If we put this at one thread, so we don't have any of that thread switching going on, uh, you'll see that these are much faster. And this is because you know the, the context switching between each of the threads adds a bunch of time to their overall execution, but there is true threading here. Uh, one thing that I want to show, so we, we had that little diagram before where I said, you know, if there's, if there's only one process running, uh, due to some sort of lock, you'll generally only see 100% utilization at max. So if we put this back to four and we run this and take a look at top, um, you'll see that our Python process is maxing out at 100% CPU. It's slightly over 100, and that's due to the, the context switching. Um, but we're maxing out at 100, even though we have four threads, where theoretically we should be able to max out at about 400%. Actually, I think probably 500% because main thread, but 400%, a, a number that's bigger than 100%. Uh, but because of the global interpreter lock, we're only able to execute this pure Python code in a single thread at once. And so that's why we see this 100% you know, usage here. Now, I, I get a common uh, misconception about Python and says that Python doesn't actually have real threads. And I want to clear that up very quickly. Uh, so we're going to make a very small... Uh, a very small program with concurrent.futures.threadpoolexecutor. And just to show you that these are real threads. Uh, so we can just do list pool. Pool.submit. We're going to do time.sleep uh, 10, I guess. Oh, <laughs> Maybe I should put this on its own line. Uh, futures, and this list call here is just to exhaust this iterator. Um, I could use tuple or a for loop or anything like that. But we're gonna we're gonna run this piece of code, and this is going to spin up four threads and two dot pi. So hopefully I can catch it before it exits. This one here, and I did a video on PS tree. I'll try and link that as well. Uh, but you can see here that this main process two five three five, which is what I spawned here, I spawned four. Sub processes, they're actually threads, That's and you can tell they're threads because of the curly braces around them. Uh, on Linux, threads get their own process IDs, so you can see there are four other processes here, um, pro pro processes, because they're, they're threads. Uh, but you can see that we did spawn real threads as a result of this, but because of the global interpreter lock, they don't really, they don't act like threads as well as they could. Um, but yeah, they are real threads. <laughs> Uh, one other thing that I wanted to show you here is I talked earlier about CPU bound work. So this is specifically you know, CPU bound work doing in-memory addition and looping. Uh, there are some IO bound work or waiting work which can be run concurrently. So if we put a, uh, for instance, time.sleep is something which drops the global interpreter lock while it's running. So if we put a time.sleep in here and we run this, um, and if it if it acted like the one before, you would kind of expect each each thread to take more than one second, or like much more than one second, around four seconds each, uh, because of the context switching. But in this case, you'll see that each thread is taking almost exactly one second, and so the overall amount of time is is five seconds, uh, rather than if this were running single threaded, this would take twenty seconds. Each each single threaded thing would take exactly one second, and that would add up to our uh, 20 seconds here. Okay, so that kind of goes over some examples using threads and kind of the, the side effect of the global interpreter lock. Um, but I also want to show you the flip side of this, which is if we switch away from using threads and use processes instead, we will be able to use much more of our CPU. So if we switch this from thread pool executor to, executor to process pool executor, and again, we're going to use four, and uncomment this. Uh, and we still have our top running here. So I'm going to show you what happens now when we run this code. Uh, you'll see that we get four processes that are uh, using about 100% of their CPU. And this total, this entire set of work can complete much, much faster because of that. Uh, now note there is some, there's, there's a lot of overhead here with extra processes. You have to spin up an entirely new address space. So you have a lot more memory in use. Um, and we lose the ability to access stuff 
uh, directly in memory because you had to create a whole new process uh, and creating a whole, whole new process is, is you know, can be slow as well. Um, but we can do concurrent work with multiprocessing there. So that, that can speed this up. Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to talk about here is the recent work to remove the GIL from Python. Uh, and this has been, let's see. Um, this has been, oh, I've lost the article. Anyway, there, there's, <laughs> there's some, some recent work to remove the GIL from Python. And honestly, this has been a topic for decades at this point. There have been many attempts to do this. Uh, but none have been all that successful uh, in removing it in C Python. There have been, you know, alternate Python implementations that don't have a global interpreter lock. But we're we're specifically talking about C Python, which is the Python that pretty much everyone uses. Uh, and the latest proposal comes from, uh, I believe, an engineer at Facebook who has been working on this um, that would remove the global interpreter lock from Python. And so this multi-threaded code that we saw earlier when we were using thread pool executor. Uh, could actually execute entirely in parallel. And it would use multiple processors in a single address space. So if we go back to our diagram here, it would look like this, this one here, but with all of the green lines connected. Uh, and this would be huge for pure Python multi-threaded code because it would, it would essentially make threads a very low cost abstraction. And you could write massively parallel threaded, truly threaded code. Uh, the problem with the proposal and why it's not so easy to just, you know, drop it in and, and say it's good and done is it necessarily has to change how Python works. Um, one of the major things for CPython is each object is reference counted and that decides how long that object lives. If it has a positive reference count, you know, some variable is, is referring to it and so that object doesn't get garbage collected. Um, and if that reference count falls to zero, then it gets garbage collected. And one of the things that's protecting those reference counts from being, you know, from having the proper value is the global interpreter lock. And so you, you cut that out and you suddenly have to come up with a new reference counting scheme that is still safe in the, um, in the realm of multiple threads. And so a lot of, a lot of the work for no GIL is, is managing reference counts and making them work properly. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> the, uh, the work there changes how a lot of the low-level parts of Python work. So changes how you know reference counting works and how C extensions work and, and a whole bunch of stuff there. So unfortunately, the current proposal for no GIL would break most C extensions in Python. And so it'd be a really hard undertaking to say, okay, well, we need to essentially cut a major version where all previous C code doesn't work anymore. And you know, this would be pretty devastating for you know, NumPy or any of any of those large C extension projects that would have to adapt to the new way of doing things. Um, so there's there's a big trade off there, and so that's why it's not just a you know not just a slam dunk. There's there's a lot more that has to go into this. But anyway, wanted to wanted to talk about that since it's been a buzz buzz in the news recently. But hopefully this was interesting. Uh, if you have additional things you would like me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platforms. But thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.